And now, my lords and my ladies, it is time for our demo hour. And I'm going to turn the stage over to Lady Sophia the Orange. My lords and ladies, I'd like to ask you to please come closer, simply because we actually have a hard time filling this space with sound. And it will be oh so much easier if you come closer. Uh, so if you are allergic to performers, I have some Benadryl, uh, but uh, please, do, please do cuddle close and uh, come up here for a second. Thank you, period experience for all of us Excellent. to be certain to have hecklers. No, not at all. No, no. They forced me to work. Yes. So my lords and ladies, while our first performer is uh, getting ready, I want to ask you if you were to pick one kind of performance art that you think is the most common that you see in the SCA, one that is the most common you see all the time, how would you describe that? Yelling. Yelling. <laughs> Excellent, that's one, yelling. What are other performance arts that you personally think are the number one most popular? What's the most popular that you see? Bardic. Bardic, how would you define bardic? What does it look like to you? Anybody that's singing a song, telling a story, or reciting a poem in front of other people. Would that be a solo person doing that? It could be more than one. Could be more than one? Okay, broad definition of bardic. Anybody else want to offer a most popular thing? What do you see most often that you think is a performance art? A performing artist out there, what does it look like to you? The first thing that you think of. I'll start calling on volunteers. An instrumentalist, an instrumentalist walking around. Excellent. Okay. Court. Court. At court, we have performing arts. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I was the whole the court is a heralds. performing art. Sound heralds. <laughs> Shouty heralds. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, the peanut gallery in the back. Somebody give me an example. Of, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. One more time. A troubadour. A troubadour. Okay, how does that look like to you in the SCA? What does it look like at an event? <laughs> Huh? Guy with guitar. Yeah. Guy with guitar. <laughs> All righty. Jugglers. Jugglers. You know, it's funny. I have not seen a good juggler in a while. It's been a while. It's been a little while. <clears throat> Love the fire. And by the way, I have to tell you, Pensick fire is illegal. Uh, unless you're in a private camp and taking your own risks, but at SCA 50 year, we got permission. So, you said something about insurance. Yes, very good. Be, be legal and stay within the scope of insurance. Very good idea. Um, can't hear very well back here, guys. So, my point is everybody has a lot of different ideas about what performing arts looks like in the SCA. And we have a bajillion different ways that it shows up. And so often, a single person's perception of what that is, is very limited. So one thing we're trying to do today is offer up a nice big smorgasbord of different ways, examples of how performing arts shows up in the SCA. So here at Kingdom Arts and Sciences, you can see, and you watching the video at home, uh, can see the very many different ways that we have that it shows up in the SCA. Because it's more than just a guy with a guitar. Bryce is nice, sometimes, when he's in a good mood. But, um, you know, guy with guitar is very common, and I think that's also very much born from the fact that the SCA was very much influenced by folk singing in the 1970s. 
and that meant there were, uh, you know, guitars in a lot of people's living rooms, and they picked them up and they played them. It was very common. So there are other things. Recorders is another thing that's very common, and solo singing is something that is very common. So there are these things that have popped up because of our regular American culture, and then there's more that sprouts out from there. So what we're going to show you today is a handful of examples <laughs> of empty chairs. So what we have for you today is a handful of examples of, um, <clears throat> of the way performing arts shows up in the SCA. There are certainly plenty of solo singers and ensemble singers, solo instrumentalists, and group instrumentalists. And there are also wacky other things that you don't see so very often, like theater troupes. You'll see a lot more commedia, uh, commedia dell'arte later <coughs> on today. But there's also plenty of poetry out there. Yay, poetry. We just, yay, poetry. Uh, we just don't see it a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of performance opportunities for poetry. And there's also uh, tons of storytelling, but it's hard to get the time to do storytelling a lot because a lot of those stories are, you know, 10, 15 minutes long, and so performance opportunities for them are not as common as we would like. And then there's wacky, fun, cool things like magic. One of our friends is practicing and researching the art of illusion, so you're going to see that today. So there's a lot that you can see, and right now we are going to start off with two examples of solo instrumental music uh, with period instruments by one of our dear friends, Lord Javon Donato, uh, who's a musical genius, and he has one of my favorite instruments out, a viol de gamba. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to introduce to you uh, Lord Javon Donato to show you two instruments from period for solo instrumental performance. Lord Javon. And his son, uh, Lord Garrett, uh, Lord William. William Garrett. William, just William, but Lord. We're going to start loud and get softer. <laughs> this is demo time, but. standing below your window playing the shawm to let you know all's well. <laughs> um, so we have this great etching of a, the entire length of the official section of a feast day pr uh, procession in Venice 
showing everybody <coughs> in exact order of precedence and who they are is labeled on the bottom of this huge long etching. And it shows, here's the trumpeters, and here's the shawm players, and here's the sackbut players playing the processional music. We also have a lot of interesting documentary evidence because there was a fad in Italy for hiring Germans. And all the families that had been playing the town music on their shawm and sackbuts and brass instruments basically lost their jobs because the Germans were better. And you brought in a couple of Germans and then they brought in their family members and then the people from the next town over hired their cousins and the Germans invaded Italy. It happened again. I am used to doing demos as sort of instrument petting zoo. This format doesn't offer that very well, but I will have them out in slack time at the end of the, the demo. Of if, uh, if we have time around the poetry slam, if anyone wants to play with them or talk about them. If you have questions, please ask them. Up and down, ask questions, stay awake. This is a viola da gamba. And this is a bass viol. <clears throat> what does it look like? Cello. Yep. Do we have any cellists or other modern string players in the audience? Violin. Violin. Can you see any <coughs> obvious differences? Six strings. Six strings, one of which is broken. <laughs> Easy mode, it has frets. Just like a modern guitar would, it has frets, so you know where to put your finger. This is in many ways an amateur instrument. It's easier to learn. And the middle class, if you're an accomplished part of the middle class, you have your chest of viols, one or two trebles, and a tenor, and a bass, so your family can do cultured music making together. But unlike a cello, it's a lot quicker to learn. Is the bridge um, flat or rounded? Uh, it's, <coughs> I think you're asking is it that? Yeah, yeah, that piece. Okay, so it's a little bit rounded. Um, now the strings are gut or metal cast over gut, and the, the intervals are closer. And I'm going to hold the bow differently. This is a period bow. <laughs> This is not quite purely a home around the house piece. Besides being used for um, performance, there are a few recorded occasions of people punching a hole in the back, hanging it around their neck on a big lanyard, and marching with ease. <laughs> because you can put out some volume, especially when you get down low. Virtuoso performance on the viol is the 18th century, but throughout the late 15th and 16th centuries, this is one of the two things you would have in your house if you wanted to have music as a family thing or music as something you'd have friends over to do together. <coughs> this is a bass viol. Like I said, um, there are small, smaller, larger sizes. The treble viol is a little one you hold in your lap. The other thing you might have in your house would look like this. <laughs> or really here, this again, this is the modern equivalent of this. All right, here's a recorder. They come in sizes from Sopranino and Garcline, much smaller than this, to the bass that I forgot to pack in the car today. And they're actually great bass and contrabass that are taller than I am. But easy to get a plastic recorder for about 30 bucks that sounds as good as a wooden recorder you pay multiple hundreds for. The biggest difference is that this is a Baroque instrument. 
you can't see it from out there, but on the inside, there's a hole, right, for all your air to travel through, and the hole starts big up top, and by the time it comes out the bottom, it's small. It's a conical bore instrument. There's a, the hole through the middle is a cone. It starts big here and narrow at the bottom. And that helps the upper range of the instrument. So in a modern or Baroque recorder, you can go up higher, you'll get a stronger sound at the top, and maybe a weaker sound at the bottom. than vials, they're a lot smaller, <laughs> probably a lot cheaper. You can have your four standard recorders, which may not be any this well no, you probably have probably have two altos, a tenor, and a bass. It's more common than the modern soprano alto tenor bass. But you can have four of these in your house to play with your family or your friends. A lot more reasonable. Now everything I've shown you so far is a single line instrument. You're making one, one note at a time, and if you want to make a nice, complex, polyphonic piece of music, which is what we do, then you need friends. <laughs> <laughs> or you need a lute. Ooh. The fun thing about a lute for a viol player is you take a viol, you turn it sideways, and you throw away the bow. <laughs> this is a tenor lute. The fingering on the top six strings is and the intervals and the sounds are exactly the same as the intervals and sounds of a tenor viol. In any piece you learn the left hand for, the chording for on a tenor viol, you can play on a tenor loop, exact same left hand. You just need to figure out the right hand. And vice versa, you can get smaller and larger lutes that are a lot less common. Most of what you'll find today is the big loop, is, is the, the tenor loop. But there are smaller lutes that match the treble viol, there are larger lutes that match the the bass viol, and if you want to get really weird, you can go to arch lutes and theorbos and have a neck that goes out to here. But <laughs> I'm not going to play the battle of on because now I can play multiple notes. strings on it, all of which <coughs> you've got, but they're mostly nylon. For most of period, well, there are 15 strings in eight sets. It's an eight-course lute. For almost all of period, what people played were five-course or six-course lutes. So you only had 11 or 13 gut strings to keep into. <laughs> you get this larger and larger lutes, wider lutes, right at the very end of period to play play for you might need eight courses. But for anything before 1550 or 1570, you should, you should get, be able to get by with a thinner neck and shorter fingers. <laughs> this doesn't need quite as much hand, hand reach as a piano.
this is iconographically one of the really stereotypical instruments we'll see. Any other questions? Am I for time? You are perfect. <coughs> perfect. Uh, however, I would love for you to pose with the uh, with your instruments in that beautiful pile. We did have a cancellation today, so sorry about that, um, but uh, Lord Johann von Solothar was going to demonstrate for us, guy with the guitar, um, <laughs> but he has, he has a lovely version of a guitar that um, he was going to explain how it is, um, uh, something that is more documentable to SCN period in its uh, construction. And um, <clears throat> so at one of these days, please go find uh, Johann von Solothurn um, with his beautiful, I think he said five chords guitar, and um, ask him about his guitar. Uh, he has a lot that he can teach you about it. He was our Kingdom Bard um, <clears throat> just last year and has a wealth of knowledge about music in his head. So um, to fill in the space, uh, Lady, um, not Kilmeny, Kilmeny was just Lady Teleri, the well-prepared, is going to come and demonstrate a number of things for us. Uh, so Teleri is another wealth of knowledge for a great many things, uh, including uh, things Welsh, Celtic, mostly Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> uh, but uh, Teleri plays the harp and sings and does things with Beowulf. So at the Cooks and Performers Symposium last May, she did this magnificent piece where she took a piece of Beowulf and played a piece on the harp and she sang slash delivered the, the Beowulf and it was just enchanting. So I don't know exactly what she's gonna do today, but she is gonna demonstrate for us some poetry and some harp playing. And I am thrilled to introduce to you uh, Lady Teleri, the well prepared. Thank you, Lady Sophia, for the lovely introduction. So, uh, in attempting to substitute for Guy with harp, now I do play harp and I do sing. I don't usually do both together, it's kind of hard. Uh, so, but I do have one piece. Now, all right, this harp might look a little weird, it's flat across the top. This is based off an uh, circa 800 stone carving with the Gothen um, <coughs> Pictish cross. And when triangular harps with the four pillars started to show up in Europe at the early 9th century, this is how they looked. They were just, they didn't get that harmonic curve until later. And this is entirely appropriate for the 10th, 11th century Beowulf I'm going to do in a minute. It's totally inappropriate for the 16th century Spanish song I'm going to do for you now. <laughs> this is Yo Me Soy La Morenica. Um, it's actually originally, it's a, it's a Biancico, so it's like a, a Christmas carol or a carol. Uh, it was for four voices, and it's from the Cancionera de Uppsala for all of your Ibero-Scandinavian <laughs> musical needs. Uh, it was it's in, it's in Spanish, it was printed in Italy, and it currently resides in Uppsala, uh, in Sweden.
person that in me no never has been and not ever shall it be. Yo me soy la morenica, yo me soy la morena. So just talking, saying the words of the poetry. I am going to put some music to it. Old English poetry, though, is alliterative. It doesn't rhyme, and it doesn't have a regular meter. It makes the music a little challenging. So it's going to have a kind of a chant-like quality. Musically, not that interesting, but I beg you to con consider it heightened poetry, if you would. It's, it's more interesting than just blah, 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 right? So, if you were here last night, you would have heard the beginning of the tale. How Hrothgar, king of the Danes, built on a high hall, Heorot, with a golden roof and tapestries on all of the walls. It was a splendor of the world. And all of his warriors came into the hall. There was feasting and celebration. The sound of their joy went out over the land, even down into the swamps and fens, where the monster Grendel heard it. And it enraged him. He came out of the swamp, he tore down the doors of Heorot, and he began to kill the men within. None could stand against him. The men had to retreat and leave the hall. And they could never take it back again. It belonged now to Grendel. What's worse, the monster was not content to stay within the hall, no. Every night, he would venture out, and no one in the Danish lands, neither man nor woman, young nor old, were safe. And this persisted for 12 long years. The scope spread the story of Hrothgar's woe far and wide. And eventually, it crossed the sea to Geatland, where a brave young hero, the strongest man on earth, named Beowulf, heard of the king's troubles, and he resolved that he would get a boat and 14 companions, and they would sail across the sea and help the shield Dane king. That's what they did. Their voyage was fine. They arrived, they moored their ship, and began to toss their war gear out onto the sand. 
They were not alone on that shore, and someone was watching them as they disembarked. Watchmen on the wall, the shieldings look out, whose job it was to guard the sea cliffs. Saw shields glittering on the gangplank, and battle equipment being unloaded. He knew he had to find out who and what these arrivals were. So he rode to the shore, this horseman of Hrothgar's, and challenged them in formal terms flourishing his spear. What manner of men are you, who arrive rigged out for combat in coats of mail, sailing here over the sea lanes in your steep-hulled boat? Many long years have I been stationed as lookout on this coast. My job to watch the waves for raiders, any danger to the Danish shore. Never before has a force under arms disembarked so openly, not bothering to ask if the sentries granted safe passage or if the clan had consented. Nor have I ever seen a mightier man at arms on this earth than the one standing here. Unless I am mistaken, he is truly noble. This is no mere hanger-on in hero's armor. But before you fare inland as interlopers, I have to be informed about who you are and where you hail from. Outsiders from across the water, I say it again. The sooner you tell where you come from and why, the better. We actually we'll are just on time. Well, already then, that's just as well, oh, because I think there were small people in the audience. So. Oh, 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 wait, I do need to get here. you to pose oh. for the vlog, because we are yeah. we're documenting yeah. this. Oh, a, a lady who does Beowulf. Bless <laughs> <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we have a real treat for the next one. The next one is Lady Scholastica Joycors. She is one of our extraordinarily talented storytellers. Now storytelling is a very broad uh, kind of an art and it shows up in a million different ways. How many of you have heard of Mistress Dervila? Lilina? Yes, okay, excellent. She's one of our storytellers who's been around for a long, long time. Uh, Lady Scholastica was our kingdom bard two years ago, and she really upped the bar on what that office means and what you can do with it. And when you are a storyteller, sometimes it's hard to find good performance opportunities because it doesn't always fit into the flow of bardic circle when you've got a 10-minute story. So right now, we have 10 minutes to listen to one of my favorite storytellers, Lady Scholastica Joy Course. So, shall it 
be a funny story, or shall it be a story of transformation? Funny. Funny? funny? <laughs> Just for you. I happen to like Jack tales. And so, I shall tell you the story of Jack. Now, in other countries, he might be Moulin Redeem. In some countries, he might be known as Vasily. But no matter where you find him, he is still a fool. Jack was a very obedient child. He did everything his mother asked him to do, and he never quivered about it at all. But he was of the age now where he needed to find a job. He needed to go out and do something to help the family because it was just Jack and his mother. And they were down to their last five cabbages. He had to go out and find work. So Jack decided that he would go out the next morning early and find a job. That night they sat down and had a bowl of cabbage soup. Now there's something that you need to know. Jack hated cabbage soup. So whenever we talk about cabbage soup, I want you to help me by saying, yuck. Can you do that? Jack hated cabbage soup. Yuck. Thank you. So that night they sat down and had a bowl of cabbage soup. Yuck. And he ate it because that was all they had to eat. The next morning he got up and he went down the road. And as he traveled down that road, he happened to see a man with a cart. The cart had a problem. One of its wheels had fallen off. So Jack helped him put the wheel back together and put it on the cart. And when they were done and before the man left, he reached into his pocket and took out a nice shiny coin and put it right in Jack's hand. Jack was so excited. He had earned some money that he could show his mother. And so he walked home. Now, as Jack was walking home, he had to go over a little bridge, over a small streamlet of water. And every day, Jack stopped. He looked over the edge of the water, and he waved at his friend and talked to him quite often. Today was no different. Jack came up to the, the bridge, and he started to go over, and he looked over, and there he saw his friend, and he raised his hand, and he waved at him, and down went that coin that he had in his hand, and it was gone. Jack still had to go home. And when he got home, his mother was all smiles. Oh, Jack! Jack, what did you do today? Did you earn something? Have you got something to show me? Oh, yes, ma'am. I, I did something real good today. I, I helped a man fix his cart, and he gave me a coin. Well, Jack, where is that coin? Well, it was right here in my hand. But uh, I waved at the fellow in the water, and it fell in the water. Oh, Jack, Jack, you are such a silly boy. Next time you get a coin, take that coin and put it deep down into your pocket. Can you remember that? Yes, ma'am, I can. And that night, Jack sat down and his mom put out a big bowl of cabbage soup. Yeah. Yeah. And he ate it because he was hungry. The next morning, Jack got up. He went down the road. And he hadn't gone too far before he found a dairy man that was in need of his help. So he helped him all day long, milking the cows. At the end of the day, the man gave him a jug of milk. Oh, Jack liked milk. And he took that jug and he started to walk home. And then he remembered what his mother had said. And he took that milk and he opened up his pocket and he poured that milk deep, deep into his pocket. And as he started to walk down the street, <coughs> that water, that milk just squished inside his shoe. His mama said, Jack, what did you do today? And he said, I earned some milk. And she turned it over and there was nothing inside. Jack, what did you do with the milk? I put it in my pocket just like he told me to. Oh, Jack. Jack, you are so silly. Next time you get some milk, you take it and you put it on your head and carry it home. Can you remember that? Yes, ma'am, I can. And he sat down again for a big bowl of yeah. cabbage, cabbage soup. soup. Yeah. yeah. 
That night he went to bed, determined he was going to get up early so he wouldn't have to eat cabbage soup for breakfast. And this time he walked down the road a little bit further, he met a man who made cheese. And he helped move big rounds of cheese into the cool room all day long. And at the end of the day, the man gave him a giant wheel of Limburger cheese. <laughs> now, if you've never had Limburger cheese, it's really tasty, but it's really stinky. I mean, it smells like two-week-old tuna fish sandwich and a month-old pair of stinky black socks. It's really bad. But Jack took that wheel, very excited about having it, and he walked down the road, and before long, he remembered what he was supposed to do with that. So he put that big wheel of cheese on top of his head and began to walk home. It happened to be a very, very hot day, and that cheese, it began to melt down his face. And it got into his ears. And it went down inside the back of his collar. And it got all over him. And before he got to the bridge, his mother said, Jack, what did you get into? Well, Mom, I, I earned some cheese today. Jack, you get out there and you get in that river and you take a bath. Now, you are not coming into this house until you take a bath. But, Mom, no bath. But I took a bath a month ago. I don't want it. Jack. Jack was an obedient son, and he took a bath. That night, when he came in, he had a big bowl of cabbage soup. Yeah. Well, it was a good thing the cabbage soup was almost gone because he really didn't want to eat anymore. And he went immediately to bed. The next morning, he went down the street, and, and before he left, his mother said, Jack. Now, the next time you get something like cheese, you take it and you wrap it in some paper and tie a string around it and you take it behind you. Can you do that? Jack shook his head that he would remember to do that and he went down the road and that day he worked for a butcher. And at the end of the day, the man gave him a big leg of lamb. Mmm, lamb, leg of lamb. Oh, that would be so tasty. He was looking for his mouth. And did exactly what his mother told him. Wrapped something around it, tied it with a string, and began to walk behind him. As he was going home, all the creatures that were around could smell the meat. And they all came up and started to nibble on it. So by the time he got home, his mother asked him what he had earned, and he held up a big bone. And it had dirt and grass and rocks hanging off from it. His mother just shook her head, just shook her head. She says, Jack, we can't eat that. Next time you get something like that, you throw it over your shoulder and bring it home with you. Can you do that? Yes, ma'am, I can. And she, she says, now take that and throw it away. I can't use that. We'd all be sick. Rocks in your stomach, what are you thinking? And that night, he went to bed hungry, but grateful that he didn't have to eat any cabbage soup. Yuck. Yuck. The next morning, he got up extra early, and he went down the road, and he worked for a man that had donkeys and horses. And he worked all day. He groomed them. He got all the rocks out. He cleaned their feet. He was very good. He worked very hard. At the end of the day, the man gave him a small donkey. He looked at that donkey and he says, started to walk away with that donkey. And he said, oh wait, what did my mama tell me to do before I left? That's right, I'm supposed to put it over my shoulder. He looked at that donkey, that donkey looked at him. He looked at that donkey and said, my mama told me to do it, I better do it. So he went right through the middle of the donkey and he got his head underneath its head and he put one arm around one leg and one arm around another leg and he stood up. Now, you can imagine that donkey didn't like that very much. And he started jerking around like this <laughs> and a movement like this and trying to walk down the road. Well, he hadn't gone too far before he started to pass the Baron's house. Now, the Baron had a daughter who had never laughed, had never smiled. And he had promised that if anyone 
could make his daughter laugh or smile. They could be married, and they could live out the rest of their lives on half of his land and half of his material wealth. Anything, because he loved his daughter so. And he was a man of his word. Well, you can imagine that the daughter just happened to be at that time, walked out on the Virgo, and there was Jack, with a donkey on his back, just a moving around like this, and trying to walk the best that he could. And believe it or not, she got a little twitch. And then it turned into a big smile. <laughs> and she started to laugh. There's Jack just moving around, all just like this. And she starts to laugh a little bit more. <laughs> and then she laughs some more. <laughs> and then she's laughing so hard. Tears, tears are running down her face. Her father comes running out. What is wrong? <laughs> oh, she could just point. And the father looks. <laughs> he starts to laugh. He calls everybody else out. They are all laughing so hard. Tears are running down their face. And there's poor Jack trying to walk with his donkey on his back. Finally, the Baron takes pity on the young man and tells his servant to go out and take the donkey off Jack's back and bring him to him. When they finally bring Jack in, Jack is standing there breathing really hard and wondering what in the world that he had done wrong. The Baron put his arm around the man, young man and said, young man, you have made me very, very happy. Well, what did I do? Well, I promised anyone who could make my daughter laugh could marry her. Jack looks at her and she's kind of pretty. And the girl kind of bats her eyes and oh, it's kind of cute. And the bear and looks and says, what do you think, daughter? And she goes, and he says, young man, what do you think? And so it was that the two became one. And Jack, his mother, got her own house. And from that day to this, Jack has never had to eat cabbage soup. Yeah. <laughs> pictures for the uh, performing arts blog. Okay, give me, give me a storyteller pause. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. Tell those stories. Thank you, Scholastica. So my lords and ladies, we have one uh, short performance and then we're going to have uh, the group of uh, the Ponte Alto singers. So you guys uh, can prep here. We're going to have one uh, short performance by a <clears throat> a new kind of a thing you haven't seen before. Um, what we have here is the <clears throat> performing arts champion of the Barony of Windmasters Hill, Lord Jama de Mongo. And he has been studying the art of illusion. And believe it or not, there is some extraordinarily um, beautiful documentation that we have from folks that were magicians that wrote things down about how they did it so they wouldn't be burned as witches. Because it was obviously, you know, witchcraft, what they were doing. But in order to prove that it wasn't, they wrote it down and shared with people, and that's our documentation. And Jama has been studying that, and um, <coughs> you may only be experiencing this for a very, very few minutes, but I can guarantee you that many hours, hours, days, and months goes into producing what you are about to see. So I give you Lord Jama de Monk. Yes, my lords and ladies, as you all know, and as Lady Sophie has generously reminded us, the laws of our fair kingdom offer only one penalty for the crime of sorcery, and that is execution. So if I were to tell you that this little red ball here is controlled by my familiar spirit, his name is Meriden. And if I were to drop him into this cup, and place it on the table, and to tell him, Fade, then he would be gone, and return to my pouch. <laughs> now, 
as Lady Sophie has generously informed you so that I will not face the penalty for this crime, it is in fact all done not by any true sorcery, but by a particular type of juggling. The French call it le jeu de main, lightness of the hand. The Italians call it presti di ditazione, quickness of the fingers. I call it simple fraud. <laughs> you see, it is no different from that carnival game some of you may have seen where you try to tell which of the shells the little bean is under. All I'm going to do is drop the ball into the cup. I'm going to draw it back out. But now it's very difficult for you to tell whether I've really taken it out from under the cup and I'm putting it back into my pouch or whether I've in fact just left it under the cup the whole time. <laughs> so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to do that again, and this time I'm going to have somebody make a guess. Milady, do you believe that I have left this ball under the cup or returned it to my pouch? But here's the thing. I am using the art of le jet de main. That means I'm cheating. So whatever you say is going to be wrong. If you tell me it's under the cup, no, it's not, it's in the pouch. But if you tell me it's in the pouch, well, then you'll find it under the cup. <laughs> but very carefully, the ball goes into the pouch. And now, you, Your Excellency, would you care to tell me if I lift this cup, is it going to be empty or is there going to be a little red ball under there? So if I make a guess, you're going to make me wrong, right? In fact, either way, if you, say it's empty, if you say it's empty, you will be wrong. And if you say there's a little red ball under there, you will be wrong because the correct answer is lemon. <laughs> now, as I say, I am doing this, this lemon got there not by any kind of sorcery, but by my own two hands, exactly the same way that the turnip did. <laughs> Thank you, my lords and ladies. <laughs> The next one is what I'm very, very excited about. It's a relatively new group of people come together uh, from the barony of Ponte Alto to bring you a group experience. And I can tell you it's very, very difficult to get groups together to rehearse and to find music that suits everybody. And let me just tell you, it's like herding cats. So I want to give special attention to the leader of the group and I know that two of you have been working on that, so I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourselves and introduce each one of you. I give you the Ponte Alto Singers. I'm Bob Bonner from Fatah School. Lady Margaret Ladd. Mr. Celia Rosdale. Memoralia. And who's your chief cat herder? I mostly herd the cats, but she makes sure that we're singing. We can make the Facebook events, so. You know, Teamwork. I show up. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. We decide seat. by committee. <laughs> like we're still, we're the Fontalto singers, but we're still deciding on the name. We'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there eventually. The first song that we'll be doing for you today is Matona Mia Cara, which is a period piece from the early 15th century by Orlando de Lasos. Forget the motor.
which unfortunately they did <laughs> By end of the year. I don't think it was unfortunate when we did it. <laughs>
might point out in the uh, spirit of, the, uh, of some of our earlier performance, uh, just as the sackbutt looking object was something like a sackbutt, this is something like a Renaissance harp. It's a uh, modern version of... Tolaris. Yeah, um, Tolaris is actually much more uh, period. Really cool. <laughs> We were going to do pastime in good company, but since we see that it's <laughs> done with times now, we do um, uh, uh, monkeys and uh, nonsuch. Sure. <laughs> of performing arts is, you know, a single vocalist guy with guitar. He often is seen with his guitar, but another thing that um, solo singers do often get the opportunity to do is learn about period music forms and then express themselves 
through writing their own pieces in a period form. So this is a very common thing that happens in the SCA, and we love to sing about ourselves. In the SCA, we love to celebrate what we are and what we do through song and story. And so this does pop up a lot, and it's one of my favorite pieces of performing arts in the SCA, is our ability to study what happened in history, learn about it, and turn it around and use it to celebrate ourselves and to bring to life uh, some wonderful things that we love to sing about. So, breaking out of the song is Lord Richard Wynn. Hello. I'm going to do a little song I wrote called Far Away. It expresses a little bit of what I think Bardic is. <laughs> the Bardic calls a chance to show the stories and songs I have learned. Perhaps to earn a token prize, though I have ne'er won in many tries. Undaunted after many years, to win is not my only dream. For fame and wealth I do not sing. I sing for the joy that music brings. With harp or tune I'll play for you, or sing around the fire's glow. You need but ask and I will play. Let my songs take you far away. To a world of dragons and kin, or fields with knights of chivalry. A song of love for your lady true, on a Christmas young Canadian review. A song of honor for the men, tales of love lost, her heart to rend. To honor warriors who have passed, their names in song shall ever last. With harp a tune I'll play for you, or sing around the fire's glow. You need but ask and I will play. Let my songs take you far away. In song, the melodies and words bear dreams that fly on a winged staff. A minstrel's only true reward. A loud demot and cheered encore. I won't pretend to be the best my skill, but song is common fare. I thread to strains the poet's words, and I'd still play if no one heard. With harp or tune, I'll play for you, or sing around the fire's glow. You need but ask, and I will play. Let my songs take you far away. You need but ask, and I will play. Let my songs take you far away. Bardic like. Bardic like. Bardic like. Bardic like. It doesn't get any better than this. Right? All right, so my lords and ladies, we are done with our demo hour, and we are going to shift now into the old castle poetry smackdown. So, um, <clears throat> if you please, uh, hang around for some poetry, but now is the time to take a quick run out to get a drink of water and come back so you can hear the wonderful things that the poets have to offer. And do keep in mind that that's going to go on for about an hour, hour and a half. 1.30, you will come back in here uh, or stay in here if you've been listening to poetry. And you will get a lesson in Commedia dell'arte. And then at 2 o'clock, you will see a magnificent magnum opus of Commedia dell'arte, Wonders Before Your Very Eyes. So for the next hour, to hour and a half, we have the Old Castle Smackdown, and I will hand it back to the lovely Carolyn.